So in this video, I'll briefly talk about how to present qualitative findings. And specifically, I want to focus on what kind of claims you can make in your uh, findings, in your results chapters, what kind of claims uh, you can make, what kind of uh, claims you must not make. So I want to focus specifically on three major uh, and very common problems that I observe in your results chapters. Now, if you want to know specifically how to structure your results chapter, I do have a whole video just about that, how to structure your findings chapter. And also I do have another video in which I talk about five other common problems with results chapters, including problems with lack of clarity for how you're answering the research questions or problems with the structure, how you structure and present the findings. Here, like I said, I want to focus on something that's equally important. So specifically, what kind of claims you can make what kind of conclusions you can uh, you can make based on the findings based on your data so these problems i want to discuss today uh, although they are all overlapping and interrelated i did uh, break them down into three groups of problems so the first one is a lack of clarity about the source of information and what i mean specifically is the lack of clarity of where uh, whatever you're talking about comes from so sometimes i'm reading your chapters and is just not clear to me. Am I uh, reading about something that your participants believe and, and said? Am I reading about uh, something you know from previous literature? Maybe you're just telling me about some facts or am I reading something that's your interpretation? So what I observe uh, quite commonly is that maybe you start uh, your section with some general information about the, the theme or sub theme that we're about to uh, to learn about, which is a good thing. So again, I, I sent you to my uh, video where I talk about how to structure uh, these chapters. So you do want to start with some very brief summary of what we are about to discuss. But then uh, as we move on, I start to be increasingly confused about what am I reading? So is it still something that you're telling me about th that theme? Is it now something that somebody said, or maybe we, you're giving me some facts that you know, let's say statistical facts. So let's say we're talking about uh, migrants problem in a certain country. I mean problems, so problems of migrants in a certain country. So let's say you're you're moving on to this, uh, this theme of, uh, let's say, abuse or maybe discrimination. Uh, and then you, uh, you tell me about this one participant, participant seven or five or whatever the number is, uh, and, and what they have faced in their experience. But then you're smoothly moving towards something that starts to feel like maybe broader claims. So you start talking about uh, problems of abuse that often happen, let's say, in the UK and, and the perceptions uh, that the local people may have of the migrants. And as you're doing that, like I said, I just don't know, are we still talking about this participant seven or five? Is that what this participant said? Or is it now something that we generally know? So you have to be very careful when doing that, when doing that transition specifically. So firstly, uh, try not to mix up the discussion and the results unless that's your goal. So again, I have videos about uh, different structures and what you can and what you should not do. So sometimes you may have discussion and results together. It should be clear then, but if that's the case, then you'd of course provide me with some reference and also just use some words that indicate that we're not talking anymore about this one person's uh, perception, but rather th something that we know from the literature. So just be clear about where this is coming from. And secondly, if it is coming from this one participant, just keep reminding the reader that we're still talking about that person or maybe uh, the participants uh, in general as plural or maybe most participants or some participants just let me know that we're still talking about somebody's individual uh, perception. So even if you remind me uh, as participant seven explained further or he or she also believed. So just, just uh, keep reminding me that we're talking about this person's uh, views. Just quickly before we continue, remember to explore my website for a variety of services, mainly including one-to-one -one tutorials on a variety of topics, including planning and implementing your research study, as well as other uh, services such as writing support or data analysis services. So now let's get back to the topic of this video. And now another related problem, as I said, they're all rela related, they're all about how or what kind of claims we make, uh, is the problem of uh, generally uh, jumping to big conclusions and making big claims when sometimes there is just not enough evidence and you're not in a position to make such big claims. So again, the tendency here is sometimes that you just, uh, you, you have one quote or you have one uh, opinion or even several opinions from uh, several participants, but then uh, from there, you just go straight into making these big claims. Like I said, sometimes they, it's mixing things up with implications, which is another problem. Of course, you want to generally keep your discussion of your implications to 
uh, either the concluding chapter where you talk about implications or maybe to your discussion chapter uh, or just generally trying to make uh, big claims and trying to show how important it is uh, based on this, like I said, one or maybe a handful of opinions. So imagine you have this one migrant again and you're talking about this one problem that they are struggling with and quite often I see uh, in the following sentence something that says, for example, it's this shows or this provides evidence that we should change that or we should, you know, introduce these other uh, policies or we should do that training or or this is uh, the evidence that there is this big problem and we generally have to think about it. And, and again, while there is nothing wrong with uh, basically making big claims eventually and trying to may maybe suggest, you know, things and uh, meaningful change and meaningful... Uh, improvements in policy and practice which is why we're doing that research just be careful again why how you word it that's the first thing and also what you base these claims on so even if you do want to suggest something that's a rather big improvement just make sure that uh, that you're using this kind of cautious and vague language which means for example saying based on this it is arguably you know or or we may consider doing something just try to kind of tone it down and and also make sure that you are aware that it's, it's just it's just a proposition you're not saying you're not stating it as a fact that now we have to change everything because this person said they struggled with this in this one particular situation and then finally and again it's related is trying to imply causal relationship and causal relationship uh is generally something to uh, very risky in qualitative research and quite often something to be avoided so uh, regardless of whether when this happens where this happens just always be very careful when you talk about uh, cause and effect this is again something that almost comes naturally and especially if you're a researcher and you have this uh, this mind this inquisitive mind and you're uh, hoping to explain things and, and hoping to provide explanation for things we don't understand but again be very careful so uh, I, I often explain that cause and effect are uh, very tricky so even if you have let's say uh, the example I've given uh, several times in the past you have 20 male participants they all love football and then you have 20 females participants they they all say how they hate football and of course we're tempted to say that it seems that gender may influence you know uh, or play a role in whether we like football or not because all these male participants like football and none of these female participants love football but even in that situation, in qualitative research, you have to be extremely careful because what if all the females come from a country maybe where football is not popular uh, or maybe any other explanation, maybe uh, age, their age is different or anything else. So usually our study, our qualitative study is simply not designed uh, to make such claims. And by the way, it's not a limitation. Like I said, it's just not something you want to do because this is not the point of qualitative research. So sometimes such a uh, relationship, maybe this one was too obvious and too, too simple uh, in my example, but something about test results maybe, or something about some experience, uh, some participants experienced something in the past. And now it seems that they, they are struggling with, let's say, understanding maths or, or something like that. Again, you may uh, propose such things. You may kind of uh, experiment with, with these things and, and, and offer some thought-provoking, uh, like I said, propositions. But just, again, just try to tone it down and don't say that this is what happens. This is, you know, this influence, this other uh, thing. So just be very careful, careful with such relationships in qualitative research. And now as an additional kind of bonus advice for me, uh, something you can do to kind of uh, get away with some of these claims is uh, remember about member check-in. Member check-in. I have a video about validity and qualitative research uh, when I where I explain uh, different methods, including member check-in. Member check-in is generally about contacting the participants in different forms at different stages. So again, you have this whole video. Just have a look at the links. I don't want to explain the whole practice here, but but even this one form of member check-in where you just contact the participant and, for example, ask them, is that what you meant? Or do you think, you know, uh, I'm right in assuming that this is what you meant or this is what you're saying? So remember, with some of these claims, again, this won't work for for huge claims about, you know, changing the policy in the whole country, but, but some of these claims uh, or something that this participant may have meant uh, this may work so it can clarify whether we're right in assuming certain including causal relationship or maybe perceived causal relationship so if I contact the participant and say uh, do you think that what you described here do you think that played a role and how you feel about it now 
if they confirm it, then at least you can suggest that that's how they felt. Again, don't make it sound like a fact because they also don't have to know that, but at least you are in a position to make such proposition. So this is it. I hope that you learned something new. Please like the video if you did and also to help others find it. It really makes a difference. If you like the video, it helps the algorithm and, and the video is being shown to a wider audience. Otherwise, uh, feel free to ask me questions in the comments and consider subscribing if you're new around here.